together today is $5.99. Number six. And it's on the, it's on the screen. Have we all do it? Do we stand up, please? <laughs> I think we're supposed to, are we supposed to stand? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, all together now. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, our first hymn is uh, 525. One, two, and four.
glory to his name. One, two, and four. Let me stand on the last verse. Many of you are aware 
of the gigantic earthquake that shook Nepal. Did you know that earthquake uh, was so severe that Mount Everest is actually shorter than it was before the earthquake? Now, don't ask me how they figure these things out, but uh, Mount Everest reduced in height one inch. <laughs> but the fact that you can move Mount Everest shows how powerful that earthquake was. There are many Christian organizations that are now going into uh, Israel, uh, I mean into Nepal, including Israel. Israel has sent teams uh, into Nepal. But there are Christian organizations like Kama Services, which is the relief arm of the Alliance. And if you get on the church's web, uh, Facebook page, uh, there is a link. Or if you get on to the Alliance web page, there's a link. And uh, also there's organizations like Samaritan's Purse uh, that have gone into Nepal. Uh, World Relief also has. So there are many Christian organizations that are there and that are helping out. And uh, you can certainly donate uh, to these causes. It's very, very important. Well, I'm going to move down uh, my primary uh, uh, primary uh, guy, and that's uh, Mark, who runs the uh, projector for me, is gone, and Joe is helping out. So I'm going to put on the video a moment, and uh, we're going to ask uh, Tex if he would lead us in prayer. After <coughs> <that video. coughs> Rufinus is our Dr. Silva called me up on the phone and I knew that her mom was arrested in jail and her niece had just come back from Italy and the dead girl who had died in the abortion clinic kept on reappearing and was pushing and torturing and talking to her niece who was living in the house and this happened for about two days and the girl was going nuts. Cuando el día que falleció la Desde ese mismo instante, el fantasma, entre comillas, de, de la chica me perseguía. Aparte de eso, también escuchaba muchos llantos de bebés en el fondo. Y me comenzó otra vez a perturbarme, a hincarme. Pero físicamente, no era una sensación mía, sino físicamente me tocaba. She was terrified. And uh, she began to share what was happening in the house. So we sat down at the kitchen table with... Uh, Someone nearby and explained that Christ would set her free. Hice una oración, me recibí a Cristo y desde ese momento yo me sentí otra persona. We walked to the house room by room. We came out to the back of the house where they actually did the the uh, abortions, and we prayed in the rooms. In some rooms, we actually took oil and kind of poured it there and just said we dedicate this place to the Lord. And there's no more manifestations, and places like it changed. Yo le cuento, nunca en mi vida yo le conté mis problemas a ella, yo le cuento ahora que me pasa, nos reímos, oramos juntas, conversamos, antes no conversábamos, tenemos un grupo de madres que oramos aquí todas juntas, una célula tenemos aquí, wow, los cambios fueron radicales, pero no, no era más como antes, era, era, se sentía la casa diferente. Era una sensación muy extraña. Era un, yo, yo le describo como una luz que bajaba, no sé. Era una sensación de paz, de tranquilidad. Me emociona ahora el, el saber que yo no estoy más sola.
going the wrong way. Give them the courage to, to lead. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, and we thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, give this offering and for the cause of the gospel. We pray for the missionaries that are taking the gospel around the world and bless them and supply their needs. Always in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we are taught in our society today 
that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it. And that there are many, many ways to God. And even evangelical churches nowadays are trying to embrace Islam and trying to say, well, you know, we, we do worship the same God, and He is the father of, of Abraham. Well, when you go through the Gospels, Jesus is exclusive. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Last week he said, I am the gate for the sheep. There's only one way in and one way out, and that was through the gate, and Jesus himself is the gate. So he's going to expand on that. We're going to take a look at him as the good shepherd. Our key verse this morning, or verses, I should say, will be John chapter 10, verses 11, and then verse 14, where it says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Now, the point that we want to make, and I know this sounds overly simplistic, but the point that we want to make this morning simply is this. Jesus is the one and only good shepherd. There are shepherds, but Jesus is the one and only good shepherd. The question that I need to ask myself, you know, whenever you study a passage of Scripture like this, read a story like this in the Bible, you need to ask yourself, how does that apply to me? Well, my question that I need to ask myself is, do I know the good shepherd? All right, three things that we're going to take a look at briefly this morning. The good shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep. And finally, the good shepherd is known by the sheep. The first one, the good shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. Now again, Jesus is in a conversation with a group of Pharisees, religious leaders, who have rejected him. He has just healed a man born blind. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Healing a man born blind. And yet they reject what he has done. They kick the man out of the synagogue. What does the man say? I don't know who he is. All I know is once I was once blind, but now I see. But eventually this man born blind puts his faith in Jesus. He's kicked out of the synagogue. And now Jesus confronting these religious leaders starts talking about the fact that we're sheep. And again, class, <laughs> when the Bible says that we're sheep, that is not a compliment. Okay? Sheep, as we're going to see as we go through this study again, are rather stupid. They cannot take care of themselves. And so Jesus started out last week by talking about the fact that he was the gate for the sheep. We talked about two different gates. One was a multi-flock gate, and one was a single flock gate. To the multi-flock gate, which was near town, the would hire somebody to be the gatekeeper, and the shepherd would go and call out his sheep, and his sheep heard his voice and would come out and would follow him because they knew his voice. But the single flock gate was out in the country, probably just a rock enclosure, no manual gate. And so at night, in order to keep the wolves out and the sheep in, the shepherd himself would lie across the opening, and he himself became the gate. Now he says the good shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It should be understood that Jesus is the good shepherd, not simply a good shepherd, as others may be. But he is unique in character. There were many shepherds during Jesus' time. He's using this analogy because the hills around Jerusalem, the hills around Bethlehem, had these flocks. And there were many shepherds who cared for them. Many of them were good people. But he is not a good shepherd, he is the good shepherd. In fact, the Greek word kalos, translated good, describes that which is noble, wholesome, good, and beautiful, in contrast to that which is wicked, mean, foul, and unlovely. So there are shepherds, but Jesus is the good shepherd. Now, 
it also signifies of that which is good inwardly, character, but also that which is attractive outwardly. It is an innate goodness. Therefore, in using the phrase, the good shepherd, Jesus is refer referencing his inherent goodness, his righteousness, and his beauty. As shepherd of the sheep, he is the one who protects, guides, and nurtures his flock. Now, in order to better understand the purpose of a shepherd during the times of Jesus, it is helpful to realize that sheep are utterly defenseless and totally dependent upon the shepherd. Sheep are always subject to danger and must always be under the watchful eye of the shepherd as they graze. Rushing walls of water down the valleys from sudden heavy rainfalls may sweep them away. Robbers may steal them and wolves may attack the flock. They need protection. Even David tells us how he killed a lion and a bear while defending his father's uh, sheep as a shepherd boy. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 34 and 35, Daniel, standing before King Saul, answering the question, Can you take on Goliath? says, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, it, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. So a shepherd's job was not a safe job. It was a dangerous job. He had to lay his life on the line in order to protect his sheep. During snow in winter, blinding dust and burning sands in summer, long lonely hours each day, all these the shepherd patiently endures for the welfare of the flock. In fact, Shepherds were frequently subjected to grave danger, sometimes even giving their lives to protect their sheep. Now, in contrast to that, in verses 12 and 13, Jesus says, The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now, I don't know about you, but I will admit it, I have a yellow stripe that goes down my back. I'm a chicken. And if I was out in the country, and I turned around, and there was a ferocious wolf, snarling, baring his teeth, I would say, sheep, you want some sheep? Here, you can have them. They're not mine, I'm just watching them. Really, in fact, I was just walking by. Here, take all you want. The hireling could care less. He's out of it for the pay. They are not his sheep. But Jesus is the good shepherd, and we are his sheep. He cares for us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. Peter, writing to leaders in the church, says, Be shepherd of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording over it those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So even today, you and I are called the shepherd of sheep, uh, but in a different way. Alright, so we've seen the good shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. Now, the good shepherd knows his sheep. In verse 14 it says this, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. In Isaiah chapter 53, again, Isaiah reminds us of the fact that the Bible compares us to sheep, and that's not a compliment. Because Isaiah says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mankind has sinned. We have turned our hearts against God. We have turned our backs on God. And the story of the Bible is not man reaching out to God trying to get back. The story of the Bible is God reaching out to man to bring him back. And finally the solution 
is for Jesus Christ, God the Son, the Messiah, to come and to bring his sheep back. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, Peter says it this way, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So, for those of us who know the Lord, for those of us who have a relationship with him, we know that we are his sheep, we know his voice, we want to follow him. In John chapter 10, verse 15, it says this, Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You know, the Bible is absolutely full of analogies of our relationship with the Lord, with him as shepherd and we as sheep. The most famous one of all is Psalm 23, a psalm of David, where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie and get down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is a relationship, then, that a sheep has with its good shepherd. So, we've seen the good shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. Good shepherd knows his sheep. Now, the good shepherd is known by the sheep. <coughs> Verse 16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The idea is this. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold or pen. These are the other sheep. These are Gentile believers, not of the fold of Israel. Remember, Jesus is in Jerusalem. And he's talking to these Jewish leaders. They think that they have a corner on God only. And he said, I have other sheep, but they're not of this fold. In fact, you could say it this way, there is one flock and one shepherd, but Jesus calls his sheep from more than one fold. In other words, a fold was a small group. You could have a fold here and a fold there, but they were all a part of the flock. In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, it says, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So what we learn here is that the death of Jesus was completely voluntary. It was part of a plan to submit to death and then emerge from it victoriously alive according to the command received from God the Father. So Jesus is a good shepherd, willingly lays down his life for you and I the sheep. And then he takes his life up again. He is the only one who has died and then raised himself from the dead. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 21, it says this, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, that he may work in us what is pleasing to him, to Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, we've seen... The good shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. The good shepherd knows the sheep. And the good shepherd is known by the sheep. Now, I want to uh, put a picture up on the screen. There we go. There is a book entitled, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. If you've never read it, I hope you get a chance to. It is written uh, by Philip Keller. Philip Keller has written a number of Christian books wonderful believer, and at one time uh, he actually uh, served as a shepherd. And as I was studying this week, I had a chance to, uh, 
to do some research into his book, and I found an illustration that I thought would be interesting. I'm not going to read the part that talks about all that a good shepherd does to care for his sheep. But I want to read about sheep who want to go astray. And again, this is a little bit shocking. But this is written by a man, a Christian, who looks at sheep differently because he used to care for them. This is what he says. In spite of having such a master and owner as the one described in Psalm 23, the fact remains that some Christians are still not content with his control. They are somewhat dissatisfied always feeling that somehow the grass beyond the fence must be a little greener. These are carnal Christians. One might also call them fence crawlers, or half Christians, who want the best of both worlds. I once owned a you whose conduct was exactly typified by this sort of person. She was one of the most attractive sheep that ever belonged to me. Her body was beautifully proportioned. She had a strong constitution and an excellent coat of wool. Her head was clean, alert, well set with bright eyes. She bore sturdy lambs that matured rapidly. But, in spite of all these attractive attributes, she had one pronounced fault. She was restless, discontented, a fence crawler, so much so that I came to call her Mrs. Gadabout. This one you produced more problems for me than almost all the rest of the flock combined. No matter what field or pasture the sheep were in, she would search all along the fences or shoreline, we live by the sea, looking for a loophole she could crawl through and start to feed on the other side. It was not that she lacked pasturage. My fields were my joy and delight. No sheep in the district had better grazing. With Mrs. Gadabout, it was an ingrained habit. She was simply never contented with things as they were. Once she had forced her way through such a spot and a fence and found a way through the end of the wire at low tide on the beaches, she would end up feeding on bare, brown, burned-up pasture of a most inferior sort, but she never learned her lesson and continued to fence crawl time after time. Now, it would have been bad enough if she was the only one that did it. It was a sufficient problem to bring her and bring her back. But the further point was that she taught her lambs the same tricks. They simply followed her example and soon were skilled at escaping as their mother. Even worse, however, was the example she set for other sheep. In a short time, she began to lead others through the same holes and over the same dangerous paths down by the sea. After putting up with her perversiveness for a summer, I finally came to the conclusion that to save the rest of the flock from being unsettled, she would have to go. It was a difficult decision. I loved her in the same way I loved the rest. Her strength and beauty and alertness were a delight to the eye. But one morning, I took the killing knife in hand and butchered her. It was the only solution to the dilemma. She was a sheep who, in spite of all that I had done, to give her the very best care, still wanted something else. She is not the one who said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is a solemn warning to the carnal Christians, the backslider, the one who wants the best of both worlds. Sometimes, in short order, they can be cut down. Interesting story. From a Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. Remember our key verses this morning? Verses 11 and verse 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Again, the point is simply this. Jesus is the one and only good shepherd. The question that I need to ask myself is, do I know the good shepherd? Am I following him? Or am I a fence crawler? Do I think the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that as we go through the Gospel of John, we get a glimpse into the life and ministry of Jesus. And Father, he's revealing himself to us, and he's revealing himself to us today and saying, I am the Good Shepherd. Father, we pray that each and every one of us would submit to him. Help us to realize that apart from him, we live in dangerous territory. But Father, we thank you that he wants to guide and protect us and provide for us especially eternal life. So help us to commit our lives to Him, not just once and for all, but daily. Help us to follow our Good Shepherd. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right, we want to put a uh, hymn on the screen. Let's stand so we can have just a, a uh, changed position. We're going to go on to our communion time this morning. We have a different order of service on Communion Sunday. We're going to break bread together, share in the Lord's Supper. And Joe, there's... Uh, Two slides to this hymn, all right? Let's sing, Jesus, I Come. <laughs> Jesus also took the cup, and 
and he said that this cup represented his blood that was shed for us. Joe, would you ask God's blessing on the cup? Lord, we thank you for shedding your blood on the cross for our sins, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And we thank you for this new covenant made possible through Jesus, your Son. Amen. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your loving kindness. And Father, we do uh, continue to pray for some of these uh, prayer needs, even the unspoken ones. And also, Father, we do pray for Ivan's request uh, for the family she mentioned. And we just pray for this family. And Father, give them peace and comfort at this time. Also, Father, we pray for the victims that uh, Nepal and the ones that are affected by this tragedy. And Father, we pray for the missionaries that are doing the work of uh, helping out. We thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture says they sang a hymn and went out. So that's what we're going to do. 
Please stand, and uh, we're going to sing uh, Near to the Heart of God. And if you can get the mic, we're going to ask uh, Ben Davis if he would pronounce the benediction. 